Um, hello, everyone. Welcome um, to this coffee conversation. I'm very happy that you joined us today. My name is Oliver Polakowski. I'm the co-founder and also director of A Path for Europe. We are an independent and young think tank based in Berlin. We conduct research and develop policy advice across a number of EU policy areas. And we also want to foster wide scale engagement with these European topics with events such as the one we're having today. Um, this web talk is about the EU's and UK future within their relationship. And I'm very, very pleased to be joined by an excellent guest speaker, Sam Peters, Trade Officer at the European Commission representation in Berlin. Hello, Sam, welcome. And thank you so much for joining. So I would, I would say we start talking a bit about the state of the play, a state of play of the negotiations when we first um, talked to each other. We hoped at least that we can uh, have a bit more clarity of where we are, deal, no deal. Um, we all know this is not really the case. Um, and I would like to talk a bit about the state of play of the negotiations. Ursula von der Leyen um, said yesterday in a statement addressing the European Parliament that there are um, these very decisive days and nothing is really said and done. Um, there are three main issues that remain to be solved between the two blocks. She also pointed out the um, integrity of the single market as being the main um, safeguard for European solid uh, prosperity and wealth. And um, what I found quite fascinating, I think is important to point out that she said there must be a clear difference between a member of the European Union and just a um, being a valued partner such as the UK would probably become. But um, time is going very short um, for an, a deal to be ratified until the end of the year when the transition period ends. And, um, you know, originally it was planned to settle everything in October. This was kind of the ultimate deadline. Now it's end of November. We're approaching December. And my question is, what are the three remaining issues? Can you give us a bit more an insight? What has been discussed? Um, where where lay the problems currently at the negotiations? Well, thank you very much, Oliver, and, and thank you to uh, Path for Europe for this invitation. So, as you said, I am the trade officer uh, for the European Commission here in the representation in Berlin. And uh, as I speak tonight, I will speak on uh, my own behalf and, and, and I will not speak on behalf of the European Commission. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm not part of, the, let's say, the task force who is now negotiating. Um, but indeed, as you said, uh, maybe as a way of introduction, um, negotiations are at a very, very last stage now um, and at a very critical final, final stage. Um, we have to know that the EU and the UK have been conducting uh, intensified talks already um, since the beginning of November, and this includes also all the weekends, so there has been really a lot of effort uh, put into it. <clears throat> and now we're really time-wise at a very final uh, possible uh, stage, because we also need to allow sufficient time, of course, to the, to the uh, Member States and to the European Parliament to prove any possible deal. Um, and, and as I do not have, um, um, let's say, a, a glass bowl myself, <clears throat> I will also rely a bit on, on what I heard from President von der Leyen, who, who was saying uh, when she spoke this week to the European Parliament that a, a deal can actually be reached within a few days. <clears throat> so if we want to, there can be a deal uh, reached in the coming days, but there remain three big sticking points, and, and I maybe we'll um, talk a bit more in detail on them. And this relates to what we call the level playing field, also to state aid control and to governance. And there is, of course, still um, discussions also on fisheries, but, but the three really core issues that remain are, are these three mentioned uh, issues. Um, from, from a European perspective, so both for the EU and for the member states, it has always been clear, and from the outset we have clearly said that one of the major objectives for the EU was to safeguard the integrity of the single market. This is really the core, um, let's say, structure we have in the European Union and safeguards for prosperity and wealth for, for, the, for our citizens. And so this means that, yes, we can, um, as we are negotiating with the UK, um, trying to negotiate a very advanced trade relationship with zero tariff, tariffs and zero quotas. Um, this, this goes much beyond what we have with, let's say, Switzerland or Norway, but necessarily in order to safeguard um, the, the, the single market, we need to have what we call the level playing field, meaning that there need to be 
robust mechanisms to ensure that that there is yes competition but that competition is free and fair and also free and fair over time <clears throat> so we have to have mechanisms which will also be respected in the future <clears throat> sorry i will i know it's a coffee uh, but i will have some water <clears throat> and of course we we have seen um, with some of the, the the declarations coming from from the uk that there was um, a concern with respecting some of the, the prior agreements. So the, the whole idea of um, making sure that there's necessary remedies to avoid, uh, let's say, divergence from what has been agreed has become a main a major issue. <clears throat> and President von der Leyen said in her speech, and I thought this was a catchy phrase, was saying trust is good. And of course, they can be trusted with, with the UK, but law is better. And I think this is really what, what the negotiations is about. <clears throat> so, an important aspect is to have a, a, a governance system which which has all these aspects. Um, and again, we can maybe then go into more detail. Um, the last point that remains is also the fisheries, of course. Um, there, the EU does, of course, fully accept and fully respect the fact that the UK is a sovereign uh, country. <clears throat> but what is being negotiated is to try to have a predictable uh, access and, and guarantee also of access to our fishermen and women who have been fishing in these waters for maybe hundreds of years, long before the European Union uh, existed. Um, so we'll see what happens uh, in the coming days. Um, maybe good also to remind is that whatever happens on the 1st of January, the, the UK is leaving the European Union. So it means that um, the, 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 the UK will leave the customs union, it will lose all the rights and benefits attached to EU membership. It also means that um, they will not be covered anymore by EU international um, um, agreements. Uh, so there will be, whatever the outcome is, very important um, changes and, and this will affect businesses, but also citizens, public administrations, etc., both in the UK and the EU. And, and on the EU side, if we, we, we should recognize this as well, the, there has been a tremendous work done by, by colleagues, both at the EU level, but also the national um, administration level, and notably by our customs services and, and, and ports to, to basically face and deal with all these changes, and, and they have successfully done so. So we are ready. Um, but let me stop here, and then maybe through the interactions, we can still go into uh, further details of level playing field, um, state aid and governance if you want. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very, a very good insight and I think a very good summary of what has happened so far and um, where the problems lay at the moment. I would like to go a bit more into detail in the governance um, part you already mentioned and the also quote that I wrote down, which I found really uh, fascinating is, trust is good, but law is better. And um, Ursula von der Leyen obviously refers, at least was I think, refers to the internal market bill a bit, what the, the UK passed and um, more or less overwritten certain arrangements that have already been part of the withdrawal agreement. And the EU kind of, I think, lost a bit of its trust um, that the UK will stick to its um, agreements in the future. So it's all about governance and um, finding the right or maybe dispute resolution mechanism. Um, when we talk about the governance and potential forms of dispute resolution mechanism, are we talking about ECJ oversight? Are we talking about um, maybe arbitration as the form of dispute resolution? Or what are we talking about here? Well, I think, good, as you know, the UK has, has always rejected um, uh, to have ECJ oversight over these governance structures. Um, the ECJ, of course, is the sole institution that can um, um, assess um, EU law. So when it comes to interpretation of European law, then it is the, the then it has to be the ECJ that is responsible. But I think what what we're thinking about in terms of of um, um, governance is to really have a robust uh, system of of enforcement and also sanction mechanisms. So one thing is to have to agree on strict rules or on, on clear rules. Uh, another thing is that there needs to be also um, a redress uh, mechanism in case uh, one side feels that the other part is not uh, following those rules. Um, and particularly if you look at, at um, let's say, one of the aspects linked to, um, to level playing field is, of course, the whole area of competition policy and, and application of competition law, but also state aid uh, rules. State aid rules 
is maybe the, the most important tool to, to distort competition. For instance, uh, by giving an amount of, of state support to uh, the automotive industry in the UK, you could undermine fair competition with the automotive industry, let's say, in, in the EU and in Germany in particular. Um, and this is particularly an issue. Uh, this is an issue, of course, in, in all trade agreements, but it is particularly an issue in an agreement uh, such as the one we are negotiating, negotiating with our, our, our British friends, because with the UK, we have been so integrated for, for uh, 47 years. We have very hi highly integrated um, uh, supply chains, um, which means that, um, and, and they will, there's also the geographical uh, proximity. So in a sense, the UK is a very specific uh, trading partner. And this whole issue of level playing field becomes way more important and also on, on, on stated control. So, so if we look at uh, what was agreed in the political declaration already in 2019, there the UK agreed to have um, a state aid um, system also within, um, within the UK. We moved away. So to, to answer also one of your earlier points, we moved away from saying you have to follow the European state aid rules and under oversight from the ECJ. And the UK's original position was let's just stick to WTO rules. And as you know, there's very little on, on subsidies in, in WTO. <clears throat> so we moved away um, both from, from these uh, earlier positions. And what is being uh, negotiated is more something which will see the United Kingdom also adopt a strict stated control within the UK. But this has to, of course, contain both uh, substantive rules and a mechanism to apply it through, through the over, an oversight by an independent authority within the UK. And coming back to the governance structure, there needs to be some sort of redress mechanism which allows the other party, let's say the EU, to, to act upon if it believes that, that the UK has not fulfill this obligation of this agreement, but of course it goes both ways. Yeah, thank you so much. It's also very interesting that you talk about state aid. We are actually currently um, also conducting research on the state aid issue and trying to find a solution and provide some policy options for the future. So we're very excited to see what uh, the EU and the UK will, will find for an agreement. Personally, I think it will be very, very hard and complicated to find an agreement on state aid because the UK has always been saying that they are very keen on establishing um, a certain competitive advantage within the U UK, um, establishing a Singapore within Europe. Um, and it's not only, I think, um, the automotive industry, it is in particular um, the digital industry, the tech industry. Um, where do you see the concerns there? Um, will, will we find somehow standards when it comes to yeah, regulation um, in the digital and the tech uh, sector? Um, yeah, on the, it's good that you raised the, the point also on, on, on digital. This is again another um, aspect that is being negotiated because of course it's also about uh, e-commerce, which of course is a, a growing um, is a growing sector. And digital trade is, is uh, dealt with under the, um, under the um, services chapter. Um, and in the context of, of these negotiations, um, it's important to, uh, in a way, we share the objective to facilitate electronic commerce, um, but we also need, again, to look at how do we address unjustified barriers um, and ensure that it's open, secure, and, and, and also that there's a trustworthy environment, both for businesses and consumers. And there, of course, we, we look at, uh, particularly um, at the um, protection also of data, because we have, of course, in the, in the European Union, rules on, on the transfer of data. Um, and the question is then, how do you ensure that uh, in the commerce, uh, digital trade, let's say between the EU and the UK, that the same rules uh, apply and that uh, European citizens who buy, let's say, a product uh, through e-commerce from the UK enjoy the same protections. And this also relates to the, um, you know, the transfer of this data to third countries, because I think um, we have rules on, on what, how and, and under what conditions uh, data can be transferred to third countries in the EU. But what is, you know, how, how will the UK um, have rules on that in the future and, and will it diverge? So these are the kind of issues that, that we, are, we are discussing and the way forward on this will be 
um, basically, and this is a system we know, um, will be based on adequacy decisions for personal data. So th that's the way you can do it between, let's say, a third country, which is not a member of the EU, and the European Union. So there will have to be an adequacy uh, decision. But the adequacy decision, I mean, that's, uh, as far as I know, nothing you have to um, agree or making part of a free trade agreement. I think that you could also potentially do without a free trade agreement. But if I understand it correctly, it's that the EU is trying to push the UK when it comes to certain also consumer standards in order to say, if you don't follow certain consumer standards, we won't or don't include this into our free trade agreement, we won't issue an idiocracy decision. Yeah, but so on, on some issues, I think, as I, under, I understand it, because again, I'm, I'm myself not part of the negotiation of this chapter, but I, I understand that for specifically issues such, for instance, as on, on, um, on, on uh, ensuring the free flow of, of notably data, so on personal, non-personal, that this will be something that is essentially dealt with by adequacy decisions. But this being said, the the all our trade agreements and also the one uh, negotiating with the UK is looking to have very high standards, whether it's in consumer protection, whether it's in, uh, but also um, we, we haven't touched upon it yet, but for instance, on environmental standards, labor rights, these are other aspects which of course could be used to, let's say, undermine um, fair competition uh, between companies. If if in a, in a situation, as you were mentioning, um, where you would try to gain um, a competitive advantage compared to European businesses by lowering your standards, you could be lowering them also in, in, in these, these different um, areas. And the UK has systematically said that they also strive to have an economy with high standards uh, in terms of environmental protection, social rights, um, 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 also consumer protection. But what, what we are looking at in, in some of these uh, standards is to, to make sure that we do not lower, that parties cannot lower their, their standards in order to gain a an, an competitive advantage. So to have some kind of non-regression uh, principle included so that we we cannot lower the standards but at the same time we want looking to the future also be able to cooperate uh, with the UK to firstly to allow to adopt stronger standards because in all our trade agreements we we keep something which is the let's say the the decision making autonomy of the EU so that we are free to make our own decisions in terms of, of all these areas but also our counterparts of course the UK and other partners can can continue to make the same decisions. This also means that if we strive for higher, let's say, a protection in terms of the environment, that we can actually cooperate um, in certain areas. Um, and, and maybe flowing into the environmental and, and climate protection also on this. We, we are, of course, in the EU, um, moving towards, uh, let's say, what we call the, the Green Deal, and so, uh, let's say, greener transition which implies a lot of things. Uh, it implies also um, stricter rules on, on carbon emissions. Today, the UK is part of the, the emissions trading scheme, but it will no longer be part of it in the future. So part of negotiations, again, is, is also to see, let's not lower um, our, our protections that we currently have, because that's a specific situation we have, the UK having been a member of the EU, starts the starting point is that we have very similar protections but how can we further in the future maybe cooperate and, and develop um, um, maybe maybe higher standards as well so this is something i as far as i understand it's it's also foreseen in the negotiations to allow this um, future cooperation as well yeah thank you so much we will talk a bit more about future forms of cooperation and also potential and also potential challenges um but um let's just wrap up the current negotiations um, again, uh, we all the EU already wanted to have it done end of October because of the ratification process. Um, we are now end of November. Um, do you? That's obviously now your very personal opinion. Do you think that we will, um, or the EU and the UK will agree on a deal? It's very difficult to judge. I mean, I honestly, I, I prefer to listen to what President von der Leyen was saying, and she says that it's possible. In the next few days, so so let's hope um, that it is possible. Um, what, what was also an important maybe message in the in the speech to the European Parliament from from President von der Leyen is that 
it will it will what we need to see is also of course a willingness from from the uk side i mean it takes two to tango um and there's a lot of you know discussion in the past about uh, respecting so sovereignty um and but sovereignty as sovereign nations as sovereign entities in the case of the eu you also have to feel empowered and be in a position to actually negotiate and any trade agreement also a trade agreement you have with canada or with japan or with any country necessarily means that you commit yourself on certain um, certain provisions and you could argue that this is some sort of binding or limiting your your sovereignty but i think what what i understood from the message from president von der leyen is that we are really looking for the United Kingdom to be willing to 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 reach an agreement as a sovereign nation with the European Union to be able to conclude this deal and specifically on these points, which which really are to preserve a level playing field, which is not a is not a debatable issue in this sense that this was already part also of the political declaration. It's normally a principle that has already been agreed upon, but um, so yeah, I, I I truly hope so if I can speak on a personal level, um, but I, I do not have a crystal ball. What we have to take into account is that there has to be, of course, sufficient time, and this is starting to be become very limited for the European Parliament to be able to um, have to ratify it. And this cannot just be, on, the, on behalf of the European Parliament, this will not just be a rubber stamping uh, exercise. Now, in a sense, what has helped is that um, the European Commission and the negotiating team has been very closely involved and very closely explaining where they stand on each of the negotiation rounds with the European Council, but also with the European Parliament. So the European Parliament is very much aware of what is in the text. So it's not that they will have to start from zero trying to see what is in the text. I think, I assume that they, uh, on the basis of what I hear, is that they are really basically real time um, aware of where we stand and so where the possible avenues are. This of course could then facilitate maybe uh, a quicker uh, approval process, but we need to respect um, the division of powers and we need to respect that European Parliament will want to have its say on it. So this, this does create um, obviously uh, pressure time-wise. Yeah, the time I mean, is very tough. And I mean, I read today that some MEPs have indicated that um, it is really needed to find the at the beginning of next week at latest to do exactly that, to have a sufficient time to, to think about the provisions and to then schedule also ratification uh, hearing in the European Parliament. They have even talked doing it uh, one day before Christmas, doing it between the years, between Christmas and New Year's. So it's, um, it's a very tough timeline. Um, I think today, um, Michel Bernier was, um, was, we don't know, I haven't read it, but he was supposed to, to travel potentially to London today after the negotiations had to move online because one of his team members had been post tested positive for uh, COVID-19, which doesn't make it obviously much, much easier. Um, but um, you mentioned the European Parliament and the ratification process. Um, that the European Parliament wants to have its say, which I completely understand from a political perspective. Um, but is there actually a legal requirement that the European Parliament has to ratify it? I remember reading somewhere that um, the, it would actually be enough if the Council for now gives its consent and the European Parliament could ratify the um, agreement potentially in January. I, what I what I have heard is that this is not considered a viable option to to have it, let's say, provisionally um, ratified, uh, basically provisionally applied uh, without having it um, ratified by the Parliament. So I don't think this is the the um, process that that people are looking into. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, one one last point. I mean, we're not so sure if they will find a deal. We have heard all the arguments. Um, it's very unclear. Um, I have also read and heard from EU officials that one option could be to include review clauses or to even find a transitional agreement once again um, that would make it a bit easier maybe to agree for both sides now and to kind of get, get back to certain points in two, three, four, five years and to review the entire thing over and over again. Is that a realistic option or is that just the Brussels bubble speaking? Um. I don't want to accuse the Brussels bubble, but I think what the focus is now uh, is very much to 
to agree on a deal. I think um, in a sense, the texts are known, uh, the positions are known. This is not something which, which uh, you know, is, is it has been debated and discussed for a very long time. So I imagine that really, um, as I understand it, both sides are really discussing on the basis of of real texts uh, with real, you know, um, it's very clear where, where they could land. But uh, what we are looking for is a, is a um, let's say, a, a forthcoming attitude from the UK side to actually want to conclude this deal. And then, then you are not necessarily looking in to all the alternative options. This being said, I can imagine uh, that on some technical aspects, you know, it's, it's standard in trade agreements that um, you will still have to have um, updates or, or decisions taken in the context of committees, maybe on, on specific technical issues. This is, this is not uncommon, uh, but on, on really fundamental um, aspects of a trade agreement, this is not really an option because you need to have the, necessarily, the necessary legal certainty also for uh, business uh, to know on, on in what, which context that you actually can trade. Um, so it's not that you can have a, an empty framework agreement, let's say, which which doesn't, um, which wouldn't decide on those core aspects that are, are now still open. These are issues that cannot be discussed later. Yeah, I, I understand. You're completely right. I I agree. Um, and let's let's just hope that they will find an agreement and that there will be at least sufficient time to also um, translate the entire document. I've read also translators are uh, very worried about the time that that they have left to translate the agreement. But I also think certain um, texts are said and done, and only the last remaining parts uh, are open. Um, so let's try to, to move a bit away from the current negotiations. Maybe we, we meet next week again to um, finally talk about the, the findings. But for now, let's talk a bit about the future forms of cooperation outside of the, the trade area and the ex aspects that are included in this trade agreement, or some aspects are included. You mentioned environmental protection. Um, this is, I think, one field where I'm personally, or well, I was very surprised when Boris Johnson uh, went out and said that the UK is really on the forefront of environmental protection. I mean, this is, if that's the case, that would be very, very good and very welcomed by the European Union. But this is one of the potential areas, it seems, where the UK has common interest with the EU. You also mentioned the emission trading scheme. And um, another field, I think, is is foreign policy, but also security um, and intelligence sharing. So where do you see the yeah, potential for cooperation there? Is there anything known yet? Uh, will there be new arrangements, new agreements in the future or everything on an informal basis? Yeah, that, that, I think that's a very important uh, point that you raised. So thank you for, for raising it. Um, because yes, we, as I said in the beginning, the UK will no longer be a member state as of the 1st of January. This also means um, that they will be, this means they will be a third country outside of a Schengen cooperation zone. Um, and they also, it also means that they will no longer participate in, in uh, Europol or Eurojust or any other of the agencies that have been, that are supporting the fight against crime. It also means that they will not have the direct uh, real-time access anymore to sensitive EU databases that, that basically support you in, in, in creating this area of freedom, security and justice that we have. This is something which is only open to member states. So this is, of course, a big issue because we have, uh, we have of course, a common interest um, to ensure and continue to ensure the security of both the UK and, and, and European citizens. Um, and it's against this backdrop that basically what the EU and the UK are trying to um, establish is a new framework. Um, for law enforcement and, and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. Um, and this framework should allow for a very strong uh, cooperation also between national policy, the national police and, and judicial authorities, but also to swiftly exchange uh, vital data. And this is, of course, a key issue um, because if you're no longer part of the, the EU, this again has, a, has a, a, um, an aspect to it of, of you know, how to ensure that the guarantees for the protection of human rights and, and treatment of personal data, etc., that we have in the EU, how can you ensure that this is further guaranteed and if you exchange it with a, a third country? And, and so the, the EU has been mainly looking to, to see how um, this commitment can be given and, you know, in a way to protect, you know, the, 
that's to the same effect in the UK uh, legal context as we have with the European Convention of, of Human Rights, and also that they uphold the same um, the same levels of data protection standards. Um, so this this would be important in, in, to enable the authorities in the UK also to to have access to what we to even DNA information, for instance, or or what we know as the passenger names records or PNR, which is which is important in the fight against uh, terrorism, notably. Um, and we would go very far. It would be with the UK the first time that we exchange is with a with a non Schengen third country. Um, but, but so they are negotiating a framework to to allow that. But there need to be again the necessary safeguards. Yeah, I think the the, the tough uh, balance here is to, on the one hand, saying what also Ursula von der Leyen says, there must be a difference between being an EU member state and being an um, special country outside, which which the UK would be. But then at the same time, it's like you mentioned, the UK is or was a former member of the European Union, leaves us, and it's beside that when it comes to security. Um, I think the the most important partner for the European Union in the future because they have a lot of information, but they are of course also interested in the information that's in the European Poll database. The German government is um, very reserved about the access uh, when it comes to, to Europol. Um, I don't know how it is in the other EU countries, but will there be any agreement in the future or how can, for example, when we, when we talk about Europol and the database, uh, is there any potential framework um, at the horizon or is that um, completely out of out of question to have, for example, direct access? I think it's part of what is being negotiated. So I, ex I expect that uh, this would be part of, of, of uh, an agreement. Uh, but again, I don't have a crystal ball and, and I'm not part of the task force. So, so um, let's don't shoot me if in, 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 in the end, if we see that there's an agreement and this part is still left out. But I, I imagine that precisely these aspects have been um, negotiated, uh, particularly because of the concerns by countries such as Germany, who that has one of the highest standards in, in data protection and protection of personal data in this. So this is, of course, um, there has to be an agreement which, which meets um, standards of, of, of all the EU, of course, and uh, I, be, I understand that this is part of, of the negotiations, but how, how far they are to have this part of the final agreement, I, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah, and we will definitely not shoot you, we will probably just invite you again and talk about the final <laughs> Um, but let's stay a bit uh, still with the potential forms of cooperation. Um, the UK has, on the one hand, always been also a strong voice for, for market and a liberal market economy in, in Europe. Um, some some there are countries such as um, also Denmark and also Sweden that will probably miss this market liberal voice. Um, now, since they left and the uh, transition period is over and we're kind of being in this international environment and trying to, to find collaboration on international level, for example, international organizations. Um, will there be a future or special relationship between the UK and the EU? Will they closely cooperate? Um, or is it just seeing where are the benefits for me if I'm the UK to see, okay, I have joint interest, I'm doing it, or I don't have the joint interest, I'm, I'm not doing it. Is that what the future relationship will be? Mm -hmm. I, I understand that this is again part of the of the relationships that we would like to have with the UK in the future is precisely to allow uh, also further cooperation in 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 various areas because we have done so in the past and you mentioned a very um, good example. Uh, this can you know be to to have similar positions, for instance, in international in international uh, institutions. This is something where there would clearly be value if, if the EU and the UK can further cooperate and have, let's say, um, ex ante uh, cooperation mechanisms that would allow um, to, to agree on certain positions. Um, this being said, um, as, as we mentioned, the UK um, will no longer be a member of the EU, so is a sovereign country and, and will be able to, um, to have its own, own decisions there, but there, there could be an interest both for the UK and the EU to, to precisely have this dialogue and, and, and have this possibility to, to, to represent common positions also in international 
um, institutions or in international on international uh, issues. Yeah, I understand that there's still so many open questions and we're desperately waiting for, for answers. So see if we get some um, over the weekend, beginning of next week. Um, but I also know that there are areas where the UK has been very clear that they are not interested in cooperating or they have their standpoint and are not interested in, um, in deviating from that. So what are those areas? Well, you, you tell me. <laughs> I mean, uh, you said you heard it. No, no, I mean... Um, uh, yeah, I'm of course more looking at it from a trade angle. So, so maybe you're talking about areas which are not so related to trade. And if you look at um, the context we live of trade, we have we have had the UK making very clear that they did not wish um, to have, for instance, um, the, the ECJ um, continuing to having a role in the, in the UK. But I guess you're more looking at other policy fields. So. Nothing springs to mind, I must say, uh, for the moment. So maybe you have, you have better ideas there. Now, I was actually thinking a, a lot about the trade issues, and I mean, you have addressed those points. Um, state aid remains one of my also personal interests, where I'm very concerned about any potential agreement. To be honest, so this remains an open point. I understand that you're not um, aware of what is negotiated, and and we will probably not know before next week, and maybe not even then. Um, but the en entire aspect of, I think, regulatory standards, um, and I think the UK has been clear, um, for example, on, on tech, that they will subsidize and um, in forms of tax uh, de decreasing uh, taxes and when it comes to tech policy. So I think this is one of the areas where mm -hmm. they have been quite clear. Yeah, no, no, as, as this is the principle, yes. So the UK really has, has always defended the position that they, um, they do not want to join did not want to join customs union, did not want to join uh, EAA, they wanted to have to, the possibility to diverge on, on, on rules, not really also on, on, um, on the standards. Um, so yes, there will be, of course, uh, the, the, opportunity, the possibility for the UK to diverge in these areas. But there, of course, we come back to the discussion on, on level playing field, um, where, where this would be, um, um, let's say, targeted or, 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 or div done in a way to to undermine the level playing field and trying to um, um, create unfair competition with with uh, companies that are within the European uh, market within the Europe, uh, within the single market while never forget while the agreement that we are looking into is to give a similar access to the to UK companies to the to the um, um, single market um, with zero tariffs zero quotas then of course we we have again the discussion on level playing field and then we have again the discussion on having the necessary um, instruments to to ensure that this that this is not done so the necessarily redress mechanisms uh, in case there would be such a violation so yeah so there i think we we come always back uh, also in our discussions to the very core of the of, of the discussions and the very core of what is still on the table i think uh, at this very last minute yeah, thank you so much. And that um, excellently summarized where we are currently. It is a free trade agreement that is negotiated, but there are so many policy areas that are included and that makes it um, complicated and, and hard to follow from an outside perspective as we're really desperately waiting to see some results and to see if the policy options that we have in mind are actually um, considered or maybe they, the EU and us, the UK deviate completely from that. But I would say we give um, the floor now to our audience and for some key and a so please everyone if you have a question for sam um you find the q and a tab there and i see there is already one um and we we will try to answer as many questions as we can so the first question um, comes from margarita and she asked in your opinion how will post brexit eu uk cooperation look like as far as the eu ets is concerned well from from the eu side um what we are looking into is to basically have a, uh, a sort of system in the UK which which continues to look into carbon um, emissions. So in a sense to, I will not maybe use it, but I, I will use the word replicate uh, what we have in the ETS system also, um, also in the UK. So that's what we would think that would be a good way uh, forward. Where we stand exactly on this or, or what are the, you know, chances are to have such a system 
again, I'm not aware of the, of the details, but I think from the EU side, this is something we wanted to see as part of, of a closer cooperation also on, on, on climate protection and, and on, a, on an intended, and then let's say an intention expressed on having high uh, level of, of climate protection. Yeah, thank you so much. And do you know, you mentioned on the EU perspective, do you know what the UK perspective is on the ETS? If they are interested, have they announced that they're interested in joining some kind of form of cooperation there? Um, no, no, I, I will not try to venture and try to explain their position because I, I might say something which is not correct. So I, I yeah. <laughs> completely okay, obviously. Um, okay, so we have space for some more questions, um, but I can't see any at the moment. So we I maybe just to, to add one point, of course, is that um, we have, of course, both the UK, EU and the UK have, of course, committed to the Paris Agreement. Um, so there is a there is a goal of economy wide uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So it, it is not something which is which is outside the bandwidth, let's say, also of the policy within the, within the UK. So, um, yeah, so I think what we're looking for is to have a system of of carbon pricing or at least have a same scope of, of effectiveness as what we have under the ETS and maybe a system which could be linked to our ETS system. But but what concretely is in, in the end agreed upon that is something that, that I don't know. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. But that was a, was a great um, additional point. Um, as we're waiting still for some more questions, but I actually have one um, in, in light of the current um, on the, the previous elections in the US, um, Joe Biden winning. I mean, I don't think anyone here uh, is, is, is thinking else. So I think that also he also mentioned already or had made a statement in regards to the current negotiations when it comes to, to Ireland and saying that is, it's, um, I can't remember and recall his exact statement, but that is impossible to imagine that there is a, a hard border between Ireland and um, and the UK. So um, do you think this will make a final impact now that um, uh, President-elect Biden uh, was uh, the winner of the election or does that doesn't make a difference at all to, the, to what we're doing here in Europe? Um, again, difficult to judge. I, I, I cannot speak on behalf of, uh, let's say, of, uh, of the British uh, uh, point of view on that uh, aspect. Um, but let's make it very clear from, from the European perspective, we have agreed uh, in the withdrawal agreement on uh, making sure we, you remember how difficult it has been because the UK has, the, has taken the, the direction of, of not being part of a customs union, of not being part of a system which would, would have made it, let's say, automatically um, uh, so that there would not be a risk of having a, a hard border in Ireland um, between Northern Ireland and, and, and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and this is, this is an agreement that we have reached, um, that the UK has agreed to, to avoid having such a hard border. So to see, you know that, of course, with, with the current um, uh, process ongoing, uh, where the um, the EU is, 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 is basically opposing the, 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 the internal bill that, uh, I don't know how it's exactly called, internal market bill, I think, in the UK, which would risk putting that into question, albeit the UK said it's only in a minor way that it would violate international law. It's still a violation of, of, um, of an agreement that has been reached. And this is an absolute no-go. Um, it has been made very clear by the European Union side that um, we cannot uh, put that into um, question so that that would be absolutely impossible to have any agreement possible if, if there would be a violation of the agreement that we have to precisely prevent having um, any sort of border between um, the two islands in, 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 in on the island of Ireland. So that in itself I think is a, is a hopefully an important and pressing pressure and then whatever comments that maybe the, the president-elect has made, I think um, I find it pretty normal that, that um, um, any, because the, you, let's not forget the US was also part of negotiating the peace agreement. So they're really parts and parcel to, to guaranteeing this, this peace process. <clears throat> so of course it's something close, close to their hearts as well.
Exactly, and Joe Biden is of Irish descent, so <laughs> that makes it an additional point for him, I guess. Um, we have one more question that's a very a general question, um, I think, um, but very interesting. Do you think that the UK's withdrawal will undermine the EU's role on the global stage? Big power leaving. Well, I think we, we, we heard many of our political leaders uh, say, and I think we all instinctively feel that um, Brexit has, is not a win-win, uh, for it cannot be a win for anybody, it's a, it's, it's a loss-loss, so we all lose something um, within the European context having uh, lost such a, uh, an important and, and, and uh, appreciated member state has been a process that we all had to come um, to terms with. Um, now of course we are at the stage where we're negotiating an agreement uh, that hopefully will allow to have further cooperation outside uh, the, the earlier scope, but um, obviously it is uh, also a loss um, in a sense also for the European Union side. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think this is um, the, the main point. So I'm very excited to see what the two blocks will agree on um, during the weekend at the beginning of next week or if the deadline will be pushed a bit more. Um, a lot has been made possible during the, during the recent weeks, so I wouldn't say it's completely impossible that it will be pushed a bit more, but um, let's just keep the fingers crossed that there will be a deal until the end of the year and that lots of the questions that we raised today and that we discussed will be resolved, that we have new findings, and um, then we meet again and discuss about those results. Thank you very much, and I, and I, I, I would like you to, uh, to write in a contract <laughs> What you just said, so I will join your um, your positive uh, outlook on hopefully an agreement in the coming days. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam, for, for joining us, and thank you everyone for for tuning into this uh, today's web talk. Um, as I said, we're waiting for the results, and um, once we know a bit more about the Brexit or the uh, agreement, we we will talk again. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye bye. Goodbye. Have a good evening, everyone.